So I'm going to kick this off with, by asking both of you a question, which is, how is it and what is it to each of you to be a bar historian? Terrifying responsibility. <laughs> There's a lot that's been written about McSorley's and a lot of it's wrong. And one of the most difficult things I had to go against was Joseph Mitchell's landmark piece. There were a lot of things that were wrong in it. And you trace back where he got it wrong, like John McSorley was 83 when he died, not 87. You find the first reference to that. And it gets copied, and it gets copied, and it's wrong. And there's any number of things like that about McSorley's. Um, let me pass this over. Um, the responsibility is terrible. <laughs> the worst part about it, of being a bar historian, is finding yourself up here speaking with a uh, way smarter gentleman uh, than I am, who has done far more research than I have, and speaking with speaking about a bar McSorley's that is so entrenched in our village life, uh, which Julius is. It's not. Julius's is not as well documented as McSorley's is, and I am uh, much more of an amateur historian than uh, Bill is. I basically got bored hanging out there and just went home one night and started to Google Julius's and different names that I had uh, come up with, and uh, here I am. So it's a pleasure to talk to you. I am uh, somewhat intimidated, as I say, because this gentleman is so smart, but I am looking forward to learning a lot about McSorley's, but also how Bill has done his research. And he has graciously offered to take me down to the Municipal Archives on Chambers Street and a couple of locations where I can dig, dig deeper into Julius's history. And that's the difference between your place and my place. And your place is keeping a low profile. Ours is right there. And it's been in the public eye nationally since 1884. It's been, there are five, John Sloan paintings of McSorley's. John Sloan never painted anything more than twice. He claimed he'd only been there about four or five times. Yeah, okay. Um, there are plays. There, it was a hangout for cartoonists. One of the claims is that Dinty Moore's of the Bringing Up Father cartoon strip is actually McSorley's. I'm not quite sure about that, but that's one of the claims. And it became the place where your common, everyday working man could sit next to a millionaire, as I have, sit next to an author, which I have, and sit next to a guy who's just passing through. I volunteer to go first. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me jump in with a story. Julius's, Julius's main claim to fame that uh, some of you might not be aware of. There was a, an organization called the Manachine Society founded by Harry Hay in the 1950s in Los Angeles. One of the very earliest gay civil rights organizations. Very, very uh, sub rosa. Everybody was required to dress up. They would show up at somebody's house and plan this movement. Manachine, by the way, is, from what I understand, a court, court jesters that traveled the French countryside one step ahead of the king. And they could tell stories about the king's mistresses and all of that stuff without getting their heads cut off. They were basically truth tellers. I think it's a very, a very clever name. They opened up a branch in Los Angeles, subsequently Washington, D.C., and then in New York City. And the New York City chapter was head was run by this fellow, Dick Leitch, who is still around, and they wanted to challenge a state liquor authority that had a regulation that it was illegal to serve homosexuals alcohol. They were, by nature of being homosexual, disorderly. So they choose on April 21st, 1966. Now friends, that's three years and two months before the Stonewall Rebellion, okay? They choose a place on St. Mark's Place, the Ukrainian American fraternal organization, where there is a sign over the bar that says, if you are gay, please go away. 
Very thoughtful they do that, please him, don't you think? <laughs> and they figured they'll get turned down. That was their objective. They alert the media, the media shows up first, they go into this Ukrainian place and say, where's this demonstration? They immediately shut down. They head over 6th Avenue, they go to Howard Johnson's right at 8th Street, and uh, they all knew the, the manager, the bartender, they served him a drink. They went to the Contiki Lounge right on 6th Avenue and 9th Street. They got another drink. They said, what are you going to do? They really wanted to get turned down, okay? So they go, somebody goes, Julius's. It had a sign over there. Hello. There was a sign in the window. This is a uh, dishonestly establishment because uh, somebody tried to pick up an undercover cop. They would send out undercover cops all over the gay bars to harass uh, the gay community. It was very widespread. And uh, they say, Julius, they'll turn us down. They go in there, and in a very dramatic photograph that Fred W. McDowell captured, and I'm sure you all know who he is, they say to the bartender, we are homosexual, we are orderly, and we want to be served alcohol. The bartender puts his hand over the glass and says, I cannot serve you. They say, here it is right there. They say, thank you very much. They approach the state liquor authority, and they say, we're going to go after you if you don't turn over this regulation, the, the human rights campaign that was recently founded. But at the same time, it's mob dome. Mafia owned all of the gay bars, virtually all of the gay bars in the village. They did not want to lose that income. Although they hated these fairies and faggots, they provided a lot of money, a lot of income on alcohol and drugs. And they sued the State Liquor Authority to overturn that regulation. That is Julius's major claim to fame. Uh, and as I say, it was three years and two months later that Stonewall Rebellion. Now I'm sure if you're his you know your history of New York City or even of those times, those were very, very heavy times in Greenwich Village with the Cafe Chino, the off-off Broadway movement, all of these liberation movements, the, the, uh, the women's liberation movements. I remember very well when in 1970, McSorley's was forced to allow women. All right, before I continue, I'll, let me pass this on to, on to Bill, and you can jump in and we can go back and forth. How does that sound? Uh, one of the things when I spoke to Faith Seidenberg, um, she was the she and Carol DeCrow were the two women who went into McSorley's in July, uh, January of 1969 in order to be served. Said they've been inspired by the Stonewall uh, incident. Yeah. They also said that they first were try going to try to sit at the bar at the Biltmore, and the bouncer was so big and scary they left. <laughs> and so they picked McSorley's. Let me thank you. Let me continue. Uh, it's nice to know that that's something like Stonewall. You know, that ripple effect was really very heady times. And all these things we take granted for, you know, nowadays was really, you know, formulated during those, the 50s and the 60s and, and the 70s as well. At any rate, Julius is, uh, was built in uh, 1826 as a dwelling. And it was built by uh, James Whitmore who had a carding factory. Uh, uh, Waverly at the time was known as Factory Street. He had a carding factory, which is part, you know, in the textile business, they have to card the uh, wool. And Amos Street, it named, it named after a farm that was once in that location, a, a fellow by the name of Amos. And that was changed to West 10th Street. It became a drinking, it became a dry goods store for a while, and then it became a drinking establishment shortly after the Civil War. Now the West Village would have been loaded with drinking establishments, serving the Irish uh, dock workers, the Italian dock workers and whatnot. This is a little interesting tidbit. Before Prohibition, there were 18,000 drinking establishments in New York City. During Prohibition, according to the police commissioner, there were 35,000. <laughs> so I don't know what, I believe Julius was once called John and Andy's. 
I believe it was once called Seven Doors. It became Julius's sometime during Prohibition. Let me tell you a story, and I hope I get this straight. The guy I really want to research is this fellow, John Bogagiano. That name familiar to anybody here? He was born in Genoa, Italy, came over to, to America as a stowaway. He was born in 1903. And as a Teenager and young man, he's a truck driver, and it's his job to run booze down from Canada to the bars in the village. And ultimately, he amasses enough money to purchase a bar to sell his booze, and that's when I believe it became Julius. His daughter, in 1947, marries Bill Fergazi. Now you all know, you know that name. The limousine guy, the travel guy. One step by the head of the law. And um, I don't get my legs broken here, but the fact that that guy never spent any time in the slammer is really unbelievable. Um, his wife, Joan Pagageno uh, Fergazi, starts mouthing off anti-gay stuff. The time of Benito Bryant, the pie in the face when she's Dade County and they don't want gay teachers in schools and yada yada. And they look at her real estate holdings and they see that she owns the most important popular gay bar in New York City. <laughs> so they could have unload that right away and they sell it to this fellow by the name of Freddie Lutz. And he owned it until about nine years ago. Uh, I came back, I was at Julius's in the 1970s, when as a, a kid in New York City, I would uh, head down to 44 West 9th Street to volunteer for Margot Gale of the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. And it was, she saved Soho. It was through Margot that we saved 30 of the old Bishop Crook lampposts. So I'm sure it was around that time, since I was right down near Julius's, I stuck my head in and hung out there an awful lot. I, I, right now, for the past 40 years, live at 14th and 7th Avenue in the Rosario Candela building. So Julius is like five blocks away, and it's a well-worn path, believe you me. Uh, I stopped going in the, in the 1980s when uh, all of our friends were dying of AIDS. The nature of the bar had changed. Uh, a lot of hustlers hanging out there. And it, it didn't interest me. My friends were marrying off and whatnot. And, and I went elsewhere. But a year before 9-11, exactly one year before 9-11, I said, my God, I haven't been to Julius's in ages. So I went down, and I haven't left. I ran into some people I knew. And I said, oh, I remember you. He said, oh, so blah, blah, blah. And uh, when 9-11 happened, I live alone, I work alone. When 9-11 happened, I had a place to go to. That we just sat there watching TV and comforting each other. And without Julius's, I would have been home alone in dealing with that. So I, I feel very, very indebted to Julius's. And then I subsequently would start to think about the history. Also, there's a you see in that lamppost right there, that's a cobra head lamppost. One of those hideous things they put up in the 1960s to save, solve crime in the village, tearing down the old bishop crooks. So I said to the guys there, I said, what do you say we fundraise and put up an old fashioned bishop crook lamppost? And I woke up the next morning and I said, oh shit, what did I agree to do last night? And I decided to go ahead and do it. We had bake sales, book sales, Easter egg sales, you name it. And we raised $6,000 to put up the lamppost. And it's my, my pride and joy. And thank you. It now costs, I believe, 17000 to put in a lamppost. What, what block association can afford to do that, for Pete's sake? Um, so I'm going to hand the mic back over to Bill here. Let's jump in. I want to hear about it's always. Okay, so you've heard about uh, researching and puzzling through this stuff. You spend hours in the library, 
you look at scratchy microfilm. In the old days, before digitization, you used to have to deal with something called Soundex, which was an abbreviation, did I just get a nod from the group? Yeah. Uh, is an abbreviation using the consonants of a last name. And guess what? Nobody, nobody, nobody knows how to file the MCs. Sometimes it gets filed as if it were MAC. Sometimes it gets filed as if it's MC. Sometimes it's even filed the way it was done in the 19th century as M apostrophe. Yeah. So I have found more stuff that's been misfiled by going back at things. So you deal with this, the dusty documents, and you research stuff and you write away things, and sometimes it just walks in the door. Uh, Bart, glad to see you here. Bart is Victoria's personal bartender, and he's been there more than 30 years. A lot more than 30 years. Stand up, Bart. Next to him is his son Rafe, and Rafe grew up in the Soilies. And I highly recommend two, by, two and Two by Rafe, his book on growing up in the Soilies. He has nice things to say about me in that. Anyway, uh, I get a call from Bart one day, he says, well this old guy got in touch with me and he's got some pictures, some color slides. And these are two of them. That's Adam the bartender on the left in 1963, and that's Tony Stampaglia, who was the cook. Tony has been noted in Joe Mitchell's work as one of the beautiful when lunch was done. Guess what? We got to see it. Uh, without that, God only knows, that would have been a story piece. Two more, that's Harry Kerwin, who was the manager, married to Dorothy Kerwin, who was the owner. This is 1963, he's wolfing down dinner one late night. And this is one other from that collection. Hello there. Pepe's here. Stand up, Pep. <laughs> Another big story for our Pepe calls me the day after Thanksgiving. A guy by the name of Jerry Keene came in. And Jerry Keene has never been to McSorley's. Jerry King had been given this picture by his mother the night before on Thanksgiving, and there we have Ed Henderson, who is his great-grandfather. Ed Henderson worked in McSorley's for many years. This picture is about 1905-1906. There's the onion bowl there. There are the pewter mugs. I was able to get a date on this from Lorraine Danishevsky, who knows her way around costumes, and she says the men's clothes say 1905-1906. The other significant thing is we're told that McSorley's has been an alehouse with the exception of two years when they experimented selling liquor and there were liquor bottles behind the bar. Only time we ever see that. <sighs> this is the oldest people picture we have of McSorley's. So we filled in Jerry, Jerry filled in us, and that walked right in the door. This is Phil, Phyllis Middlestaff. I bought a couple of copies of McSorley's Wonderful Saloon, Joe Mitchell's book on eBay. Uh, mainly because there's some interesting dedications for people in the front of them who got these as gifts. This one shows up, I open it, and this picture falls out. And I get in contact with the woman who sold it to me. This came from Phyllis's estate. Phyllis's husband was a Navy photographer during the war. Before that, he was a Hollywood still photographer. He, quote, always had a camera with him. Well, he was stationed in Philadelphia. He came to New York. He discovered McSorley's. His wife came from the West Coast to visit him, and he had to take her there. Except they wouldn't let her in. Oh, so they served her outside. <laughs> McSorley's meant so much to her that she got the book. In that book was a clipping about the liberation of McSorley's in 1970, and this photograph. So, what we always like to see with the pictures of McSorley's is what hasn't changed, or play what has changed. I get a call from Maddie, the owner, and he's got a letter. And the letter's from a 94-year-old woman out in Queens by the name of Mary Rago. Mary Rago lived upstairs in the 1930s. She tells me 
uh, I ended, ended up interviewing her. She tells me about Mr. McSorley would give her a bucket of ale to bring up to her brother and her mother at night. He wouldn't let her in. And she ends this by saying, is the naked lady still over the bar? Well, the naked lady was never over the bar. She was in the back room, so she must have been able to peek in from the back door to see the naked lady. Anyway, in with her clipping is, in with her letter is this clipping. And here we see Bill McSorley and Dan O'Connell. And this is, this is from a 1970s Queen's Weekly newspaper. And the credit on this is the Queen's Library. So I'm really excited to see this picture because we've never seen, what we've seen of Bill McSorley before this, and this is all I've got, is this grainy newspaper picture. We've seen him behind the bar in the John Sloan painting, 1912. We've seen him with Ed Henderson, 1906. We've seen him, this is the New York World photo, all I've got is the grainy microfilm shot of this, 1919, just before Prohibition. We see him in McSorley's Cats, John Sloan, 1929. And that's Prohibition, by the way, and they all seem to be drinking something, don't they? <laughs> Bill McSorley was said to keep 17 cats and feed them ground bull livers, and when it's time to feed them, you went thirsty. So this is all I've got. And I call the Queen's Library, and the librarian is adamant he does not have this picture. And I send him a fax with this. He says, no, he doesn't have it. It turns out that the librarian and the author of this had some words some time back, and they don't get along. The author, I get a hold of him. He's on the head there. I get a hold of the author, and the author tells me, yeah, he gave that picture to the Queen's Library. He bought it. It was an old newspaper picture. He bought it on Canal Street, the flea market, but he donated it to them. Well, it's not there. It took me four years, and it walked in the door. Unbelievable. Here's the significance of this picture. This is March 16, 1936, the day that Bill McSorley turned the bar over to Dan O'Connell, the new owner. It's the first time it's out of McSorley hands in 82 years. But it's 82 years ago today. Oh. <laughs> McSorley's bar was in their hands for 82 years. So as of tomorrow, it's been out of McSorley's hands for one day more than the time that it was in McSorley's hands. The deal was closed on Friday before. This is a Monday. It was Friday the 13th. Fortunately, nobody was superstitious. <laughs> but here we have a very wan and old, 76-year-old Bill McSorley about to turn the bar over. And there he is behind the bar for the last time. Significance of this to us, we found out that they were still using the beer engine. There are no taps where the taps are today. So he's still drawing ale, and it's still taking him a long time to do that. It's also a story that Bill McSorley had gotten tired doing this, and he kept a chair at either end of the bar. There's the, there's the chair. And there we have him serving Dan O'Connell, the new owner, right there. It's pewter mugs. There's no taps there. And that's Bill McSorley's last time behind the bar. But we're told that Bill McSorley used to come in from time to time and spend some, his days sitting in the chair there. Now, these pictures, where do they come from? I get a phone call from Greg Delahaba, who's the son-in-law of the owner, and he also works at McSorley's. He's also an artist. He calls me and he says, Guy just showed up with some pictures, you gotta see him. And sure enough, there's that picture that I've been looking for for four years. And I swallowed my cough drop. So I get a hold of him, and I said, so, what can you tell me about him? He says, I bought him on eBay. He said, they showed up, they were there for three minutes, and I bought him, I'm going to buy it now. I said, what can I pay you for him? He says, nothing, you can have him. So, we get in touch, and this is Bernice Abbott photograph, okay? They allowed her into McSorley's, November 1st, 1937. Significance of this, she took two photographs for Vanishing New York of McSorley's inside. A woman was allowed in to take them. She never printed them. And they sat for over 70 years, unpublished. The Museum of the City of New York finally published them. 
Here's where we go into something interesting. Andy Rudolph, the guy who gave me the pictures, says, that's Bill McSorley. And I said, no way. He wasn't going to sit still when Bernie's Abbott came in there. He says, no, 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 take a look at that. And he said, he points out an age spot on his face. He points out the ring. And I point out the earrings. And I said, absolutely, you're right. That's Bill McSorley. So he sat still while Bernie's Abbott went through that. Uh, I was skeptical. He points out the age spot. I look at the ring in the ear. It's Bill McSorley. And as far as we know, it's the last picture taken of him because he dies nine months later. Um, do I have that quote? I do not. This is the latest one that walked into the bar. This one actually came to me over the internet. About four years ago, I get a call from Teresa Marble. She's the daughter of the owner. She's a 20-year bartender there. Bartender there. Uh, she's there. She says, there's a woman here who descends from John McSorley's sister. So I asked her a question. Right answer. I asked her a question again. Right answer. Third question. Right answer. I asked her to get as much information from her as she can. She's the real deal. Several years earlier, I had met a descendant of John's great-great-grandson. Uh, he's a retired priest from Long Island and is a direct descendant of John McSorley. Through ancestry, a woman from Pennsylvania contacted this woman, uh, who's the descendant of John's sister who lives in Maine. Um, this woman is a cousin of the priest, and this photo is Delia McSorley, John's daughter by his first wife. She died at 39 in 1882. And you never know who's going to walk into the bar. <laughs> and that's all, folks. <laughs> If any of you here have uh, been to Julius's? And yes. Holy oh, mackerel, no kidding. And, and it, it, I'm assuming that would have been the 50s when it was straight? They're not all gay, come on. I mean, when the, the 60s, 70s, or when it was mixed, or what? Gay pride parade? It's a great spot to watch it. It goes across Christmas Street, so you're a little bit removed. Right. Anybody else? What, what years do, do you think you went in? The 60s. The, in the 1960s? And did, did you notice many homosexuals? Or? <laughs> oh. Right. Because it used to open at like 7 in the morning. And a lot of the, uh, the, the, the police officers from the 6th precinct would come over and have breakfast there. Interesting. No, no, I wish it did. I wish it did. I do my best um, to make sure it, it uh, stays known as a gay man's spot much of the consternation of some of the bartenders and even some of my friends who think now that we, we can get married it's a level playing field and that we should welcome everybody. Uh -oh, not me. <laughs> Lesbians are one thing. But we do have occasions when uh, you'll have a group of young women show up and they're, on a, they're having a engagement party and they'll take over prime real estate in the front of the bar and have like three margaritas and I don't know folks but there's something to a gay man's ears that you know that voice <laughs> that that really is is just so I you know I kind of keep my mouth shut it was funny just a month ago and, and I live in fear of being 86. Because I'm 86, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. But there was a straight couple came in. They weren't kids, all right? They weren't teenagers in love. They were like 30-something. And they were seriously making out at the bar. 
And I, I finally, I had it. And I went up to them and I said, do you really need to do that here? And they both said, oh, okay, okay. And then they finished their drink and left. And I'm going to continue to do that because, you know, it's a question to me, excuse me, of respect. And respecting the environment you're in, it, 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 it's akin to me, I'm a tour guide, right? And uh, I have a couple of my tour guide friends right here. And uh, it's akin to me, the tourists who go up to a Harlem church for Sunday services in Bermuda shots, listen to the music, and then bolt. And that really, you know, it's a, it's a thing that tour guides discuss and what they want to take groups there for that, and because the churches are not happy with it. And that's that kind of respect that you're in, a, you're in a bar that is known for serving gay men. And this is where we get together. This is where we can talk and plot and gossip and complain. And uh, I couldn't do, you know, I couldn't go in there into McSorley's and make out with a guy, yeah. you know, or even show any kind of signs of affection. Bill, if you want to try it, we can, you know, <laughs> you're looking real good to me from this light. <laughs> um, and I suppose that sounds weird, uh, but I, I just wanted to continue to be part of our identity uh, for gay men to go to. So. Jump in here. You, yeah. yeah. No, what I want to say is, you sound like the guys at McSorley's when they wouldn't let women in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where are we going here? The community at McSorley's. It's changed, and Pepe will testify to this. Bart will testify to this. Once it was old guys in the daytime who were nursing their ales, having their lunch, meeting friends, they had their space, they had their chairs, they're gone, they're dead, there's no more cheap housing, it was just off the Bowery, it was never a Bowery bar, it was just off there, there's, there's no cheap housing in East Village anymore for the pensioners. It's heavily touristy now. Um, one of the things that Harry Curran, the manager, had said was, you couldn't become a regular at McSorley's until you've been going there for 30 years. <laughs> so I'm proud to say I'm a regular. <laughs> but the clientele has changed. Uh, I first discovered the place in 1970. Don't do the math. Drinking age was 18. I was a newly minted 16-year-old at the time. Okay? I didn't look 18 when I was 25. <laughs> I got let in. Um, <laughs> it, it was love at first sight, sorry Lou, uh, it, was, it was a time capsule. You walked in, and that's one of the things I say about the pictures, you look at what hasn't changed, and then you try and find something that has changed, and why did it change, and very little, it's part of the charter of what, when you buy it, is nothing gets changed unless absolutely positively has to. Which is really pretty awesome. Uh, because I fight with, with the owner, the current owner, about changes she wants to make. And um, little vases of flowers on the bar. <laughs> we now have an internet jukebox, which really irritates me. It's far, far too democratic. Because you get people come in and pump in rap music or hip hop or, you know, whatever, and, and the bar is stuck with it. Gay bars traditionally had their own jukebox, and, and they were known, Harry's Back East, up on the Upper East Side, best jukebox in, in gay bar history. You know, so we had a jukebox, you know, for regular stuff that, and we had a guy who stuffed it with, with whatever he, he put in it. And uh, I fought Helen tooth and nails to keep the old jukebox, but now we have this internet one. So she, she's been making these subtle changes that I'm not, you know, a thousand percent um, 
happy about. And uh, she's taken over decorating. <laughs> Suburban mom. I mean, it looks like a TGI Friday sometimes. It's just all this horrible stuff. But, but, but she does it, and, I, and you wouldn't mind that the day Valentine's Day comes down, St. Patrick's comes up. You know, that I, I want it to be just a bloody bar. Because it looks good, it's got all that beautiful wood. You know, it's just, just let it be a bar for a while. But she, she likes to decorate it. Tell me about was the fixtures that have been taken out that you've saved. Tell us about those. I'm glad she's not here. <laughs> there, there are some, there are some items that, in the back room there, where I put up an exhibit of uh, some of the movies that have been filmed there. Boys in the Band, Next Stop, Greenwich Village, and uh, she removed some of the stakes that I grabbed a hold of. Also, parts of a Rupert beer barrel that that serves our tabletops. Um, and you know, a new manager. That's why. When I first met Bill, he said that there's a rule of Ixulis, nothing gets changed. I thought, oh my God, but I love that, you know, the Julius's. We, <laughs> yeah. we don't have sawdust on the floor as we used to. The uh, speakeasy door and back with a little slide panel is gone, I mean, which I think is a landmark violation. You see, that's my exhibit back there, but it once used to have stakes evocative when they, they would put hay there to feed the horses that would pull up. Um, yeah, it's still, yeah, there they are, yeah, with the woven thing. It, it's still a great looking bar, and uh, it's humming along, it's doing very well. But as, you know, as Bill referred, uh, 5,000 gay men died of AIDS in the village. 5,000. And all that real estate became available. And you had a lot of straight people moving in. And a lot of gay people not moving in. So it's no longer the neighborhood place that people have to schlep on the, you know, the subway to get there. And uh, that, that is thinning our ranks as the aging population, you know, does as well. I went to McSorley's. I haven't been there. The last, I, I went there a couple of weeks ago with my friend Sean here and a rainy Friday. My, last time I was there was 1978. And I, I was thrown out. A group of my Ellis Island Ranger friends was singing Wild Colonial Boy at that round table. And uh, they asked us to leave. <laughs> uh, to come on the anniversary. So, it, but, uh, so we went and it was packed. And as you say, it was tourists. Uh, and a little bit disappointing, but there was a table of old-time regulars, and they were having a great, a great time. But I was disappointed because I wanted to look at the walls, to look at all of that historical artifacts. So I'm going to have to go someday, as soon as it opens, so I can check out all of that stuff. It's so beautifully preserved. It's such a handsome bar. It kind of got frozen about 1890 or so. It definitely was frozen when John McSorley died in 1910 and his son went and screwed all the pictures to the wall so that they wouldn't get moved around. They get moved and consolidated from time to time, but the basics are where they were 50 years ago. Are you doing questions? Well, that was one of the things, um, and the, the, the judge said he wasn't going to listen to that. What happened, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, the judge ruled on that in June, and it immediately went to appeal in August, and Carol Greitzer, the city councilwoman, gets the credit for changing the law, and she changed the law that you had to, if you had a license from the state, and Mr. Orleans had a license, you had to allow all sexes in. So that changed. They signed the law at City Hall in the morning of August 10th. And uh, Danny Kerwin, who was the son of the owner, called his mother and said, Mom, I want you to be the first woman sir. And she said, no. I made a promise to my father. I'd only go in when it was closed, and I intend to keep it. And she kept it. 
So anyway, uh, back to the, the ladies' room. There was no ladies' room until 1986, because what the law said was that you only had to have sanitary facilities for the health, not the general public. Since there was no, yes, so for those 16 years, it was a co-ed bathroom. <laughs> um, we used to have breakfast burgers, burgers, hot dogs. Now, like sometimes the, if the cook feels like doing pizza, uh, we we had a terrific cook who retired uh, fairly recently, Tracy, and he just loved to cook up these incredible meals that. You know, you could take home for like six bucks and get free meals out of it. Um, but right now, it's just basically burgers. And I gotta tell you, you know, every place in town, the best burger in New York. My God. And uh, you know, Julia says, "Oh my God, everybody's famous for burgers." You know, if you tell people something, they'll believe you. Uh, but I had a burger at McSorley's, and it was a terrific burger. I gotta tell you that. Now, I, thank God the owner isn't here. Uh, McSorley's, it's a little confusing. There was no kitchen there until after Prohibition when it was required that you serve food with alcohol. But they used to hold things called beefsteak banquets there, where it was all you could eat meat for two hours. Okay? Um, yeah. There was also the free lunch. So there was cheese, there was crackers, there were onions, and there were hard-boiled eggs. But as there was no kitchen until after Prohibition. But there was a market across the street up until 1911. So a lot of food, there was, they say it was the original takeout place, the Tompkins Market. And you could buy anything there. A lot of things that you don't even see today you could buy in the Tompkins Market. So it possibly came in from there. Now it's pub grub, it's sandwiches, there's a special every day for lunch. Um, the cheese and crackers are no longer free. Cheese, crackers, and onions are no longer free, but um, Ah, the onions. <laughs> uh, they're, the onions, sorry? They are raw onions, okay? When McSorley's was an all-male preserve, there were several reasons for that. One was, if you went home breathing a McSorley's onion, your wife knew where you'd been and you weren't out looking for trouble. <laughs> the other one was the same reason um, that clove gum was popular during Prohibition, because clove takes your breath away. The onions took away your breath if you came back from lunch a little woofy. But they were cheap, they were plentiful, and they say that John McSorley thought that there was nothing better than a raw onion. So everything comes with raw onions, to this day. Okay, the kitchen right now is where the back window was that you'll see later on in John Sloan's McSorley's back room. The first kitchen was where the ladies' room is now, and that kitchen was sacrificed for that ladies' room, which I'm told has no mirror in it. <laughs> Post-prohibition, Bill McSorley had no help in the afternoon, so to save yourself a trip, they were two for 15 cents, 10 cents each. Before that, you had a uh, up until about World War I, they still were using the pewter mugs. And if you were regular, you got to carve your initials in the pewter mug. So there was no way there were two at a time then. So the two came after Prohibition. Okay. I've never seen any reference to oysters in McSorley's. There were oysters for sale across the street in the market, and before the market was finished, there were three oyster stands in what's now uh, Cooper Square Park, which is a triangle. <laughs> so they were cheap, plentiful street food. You could get them on the street in a cart on the Bowery. This is where we bring in Bart, <laughs> and this is where we bring in Peppy. John Smith, who was a longtime bartender there, told Bart that they were put up there by 
soldiers going away to World War I. They threw you a dinner, you put your bone up there. If you came back, you took it down. So those bones are waiting. They have been added to, okay? They're not completely World War I soldiers. But that's, that's the story we've got from the oldest source we have. After cleaning, we lost a couple, yeah. Turkey wishbones that hang up over on the chandelier. It's one of the things, everybody wants to be the one that takes them sorely step. So the Board of Health comes in, and the guy with the clipboard who answers to nobody says, you've got to clean those dust, dusty bolts. Nobody's complained about them, but you've got to clean them. Guy with the clipboard comes in and says, the cat's got to go. So the cat's gone. Oh, look, there's been an infestation of possibly mice or possibly rats in the basement. No one's seen any, but if the cat were there, that wouldn't be there. <laughs> Solved that problem, didn't we? Everybody wants to be the one that takes the story down. It's a, it's a nightmare. I, they, they're out of control because they shut Julius's down for 24 hours. It, 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 uh, December 31st. I mean, really, how, no kidding. Recently. Because, uh, you know, the, they score you on different infractions. And the tipping point was a light bulb was 30 watts and not 60 watts. No kidding. And they shut you down, you know, on a Friday, so, so a long weekend. And, you know, people go nuts for Christ's sake. It's like there's a vampires walking around the village, you know, with Jews. Very upsetting. I'm glad you mentioned Amos Street that uh, became West 10th because I've always loved the corner of West 4th and West 10th. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that McSorley's is not available for filming. It is. It is. They shut it down for a couple of days? No, not for a couple of days. They'll do this on a Sunday morning before opening. They'll do it. It's been shut for five minutes, but not for more than a day. Not for more than a day. Julius is. Come on, guys. Half the day. Half the day. Um, it, it, a lot of, uh, quite a few movies have been filmed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Boys in the Band, the, the, the Broadway show, by the way, it's being revived, as you, you know that read. And um, Next Stop, Greenwich Village. Um, uh, uh, um, what's the thing that Larry Kramer's thing about? Uh, the Normal Heart, it was filmed there. And uh, the John Lithgow movie. Now Lee Israel's book, Can You Ever Forgive Me, which is coming out October 19th. He was a dear friend of mine, that noted forger, who forged all those letters uh, with, uh, uh, what's her name, McCarthy, the actress. M Melissa McCarthy playing uh, Lee Israel. Um, I can't think of any reference in song. Uh, certainly it's mentioned in a lot of uh, memoirs and, and short stories of, of coming of age, gay coming of age stories. Uh, stuff like that, but we, we've had certainly a fair share of celebrities hanging out there, Abed Albi and Nuriev and you know, you name it, uh, and, and, and Truman Capote uh, have graced the, the place with their presence. What I like is when they come into McSorley's because they love the look of it and they change everything. <laughs> but as far as pop culture, uh, cartoonists, painters, Sloan painted it five times, he did an etching, he did charcoal. He's not the only painter to do McSorley's. Uh, George Lux did a painting of McSorley's. Um, Clive Singer did a painting of McSorley's. It didn't hurt that it was across the street from Cooper Union. So, now where do we go? The first woman who was served, there were two women, okay? Then Kerwin wanted his mother to be served, she said no. Then he went up, there were women waiting to be let in. Uh, Sarah Penn, who was a black woman who owned a shop called Not Carrie. It sold African art, African clothing, African dresses. She had a shop on 7th Street, the other one was 
my notes because it really went out of my head. I said this, uh, Barbara Shaw, who had a sandal shop. Then he said he invited them in, not as women, but as my neighbors. And then they let them in. You'll see a picture later of Marsha Kramer, who you may recognize from CBS News. She was an intern at the Daily News. It was her first day. They sent her down there with a photographer. She ended up being the story. First of all, John Smith, the bartender, looked and said, how does it feel to be a vulture? Um, she came in, she was served, and she ended up on the front page of the Daily News the next day. She still has the lead. When they used to make up a lead for the front page. She still has that lead. Uh, another one was Lucy Commissar, who was wearing a purple jumpsuit at the time. She, there was a big demonstration down at the Statue of Liberty, so the Times called and said, can you get down there? They needed a woman who was known for her writings and feminism to get down there. And everybody's off at the Statue of Liberty. So she was working on an article. They sent her down there. Uh, the problem with the jumpsuit is she had no ID with her. So they couldn't prove that she was old enough to drink. Somebody got a little rambunctious and poured a glass over her head, and they escorted her out, and the guy that poured it on her. Um, she still has that purple jumpsuit packed in plastic. <laughs> so it was those two. The lawyer who defended McSorley's was there that night with his niece. <laughs> so that was it. The deed was done. The next morning, John Smith found himself with a new dilemma, and that was washing lipstick off the glasses. <laughs> Six, maybe later. I'm, I'm not really sure. I kind of avoid Benji like the plague. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, on their anniversary, now it's, let me explain that it's an anniversary celebration. We don't know when it opened, but we do know it was 1854. It's an anniversary celebration that was created by Harry Kerwin because he February was a slow month and he discovered that uh, people will turn out. So he created February 17th as an anniversary day. The militia shows up. They are an anachronism because they're wearing colonial clothes and colonial muskets and they fire a volley in the street. Um, they sit in the back, they go out again and they fire another volley and then they go home. Maybe that's why they're invited back. <laughs> uh, I almost forgot. Uh, Julius does uh, fundraises constantly. The, the tradition for the raising money for the lamppost, Helen has continued. And um, on Valentine's Day, I had some heart-shaped post-its. So I went and collected a couple of hundred dollars for the American Heart Association. And if you donated a dollar, you could put a heart, write a note, and put it on the window at Julius's. Very, very pretty. So I ran this by Ariel and she agreed. I'm announcing right now a pop-up fundraiser for the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Here's our pushka. It's a dollar. And you get, thank you. And you get to write your name or goodwill or hello Andrew Berman, we love you. And I'm gonna post them on Julius's window tomorrow. I'll be making an Irish soda bread for my cookbook, the Ellis Island of a good cookbook as well. So folks, these are up here on the pool table. The dollar goes in the pishka. And here are your shamrocks. And the, you, the shamrocks you want up on the window go in this brown folder here. Thank you very much. I'm going to continue with Julius's tomorrow. So I think we could probably raise around 400 bucks. You know, and the GVSHP does such wonderful things. How could you not want to help them out? Sure. That's correct. Absolutely. She, uh, Freddie Lux sold it, uh, to Helen's husband, and he passed away rather suddenly. 
and sadly about uh, eight years ago. And here's a woman who lives, I believe, in Orange County, who has probably spent about 20 minutes of her life in a bar, and all of a sudden she has inherited the most important gay bar, arguably, in the United States. And uh, she's been absolutely incredible, uh, learning the business, uh, doing her best to you know, maintain its identity as a gay bar. I think she recognized that's where the money is, if you know what I mean. But she also is, donates very generously to assorted gay causes, whether it's homeless, LGBT youths, or we send money everywhere. Uh, you know, sometimes 200 bucks, sometimes 500. And it's kind of an ongoing tradition. Uh, but she is very, very committed to keeping it as a gay bar. Well, that's me. I mean... A gay bar. I mean, it's a gay bar. It's a gay bar, but it's traditionally been men. You know, there are, there are uh, dyke bars, if you will, you know, over in the village. That we don't get uh, too many lesbians in there. You know, occasionally. You know, I, I don't care. I'm not, you know, being a jerk here. And, but, but nevertheless, I just don't want it to become a, a party place for... <laughs> well, we have a lot of tourists. We get people who come... Who, who, we have a group of like six guys who come to New York every year for 30 years, and they spend three days at Julius's. But, I mean, we get a lot of repeat customers who have such a deep, deep affection for the place. Well, I do that too. <laughs> Folks, thank you all very much. Are we, are we done here? Are there more questions? What you're talking about makes me wonder about your relationship with your mother. Because you're talking about how you were raised in the They're still a hardcore of regulars. It's changed. It it makes those uh, makes the door swing both ways. It's there's always going to be that hardcore that keeps coming back day by day. Whether you know there's no more drinking at lunch. Once upon a time, you'd have a beer or two at lunch and nobody said a word. That's changed. Uh, McSorley's has the advantage of they own the building. Okay? That's the trick in New York. If you don't own the building, the landlord's your partner. It's under its third family since it opened. So there's a lot to be said for that. One of the things when I mentioned that uh, Dan O'Connell bought McSorley's and took over 82 years ago today, he only bought the business. He didn't own the building. He had to get that from the McSorley estate, and he had to go to court for that, and he didn't live long enough to own it. His daughter, who owned the bar after she inherited from him, would finally get ownership of the building. But he only bought the business. So if you're going to be around forever, you better own the building. Uh, do you mean to... Uh imply that Starbucks doesn't provide us with the same sense of community? <laughs> I, I, I feel like gay bars have been replaced by Starbucks. Well, yeah, yeah, but I, see, I always think there is a place for gay bar. You know, I don't care how integrated we are and, and accepted and loved and all of that stuff. I still want to hang around gay men. All right? I mean, that's, that's my bottom line. I, I think Julius's, like McSorley's, uh, will continue to go on. Uh, you know, there's nothing like a liquor license. Uh, you know, basically it's a license to steal. 
All right? So, I mean, if, if Tunis's, you know, were to close tomorrow and become a nail salon, <laughs> they're going to make so much money, you know, painting fingernails for Pete's sake. So anybody would be a real jerk to turn the place into something, you know, other than a drinking establishment. No, she does not own the building. But I, I think she has six more years on her lease. So maybe she's talking away some money to buy the building. But, but it's a very good point. It, it, real estate in New York City, you need to own, you need to own the, you know, the building. Folks, thank you all very much.